Bom, boa noite, guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren, und herzlich willkommen im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums bei der Fortsetzung dieser Reihe Lecture und Film. Ähm, ich äh, freue mich sehr, dass wir heute diese erste Veranstaltung des Jahres 2018 äh, der Lecture und Filmreihe Tropical Underground heute machen. Ähm, wie Sie wahrscheinlich schon wissen, diese Reihe hat im Oktober 2017 angefangen. Ähm, wir haben schon Klassiker wie Makunaima oder O Bandido da Luz Vermelha sowie eher unbekannte Filme wie O Segredo da Momia, O Vampiro da Cinemateca und Meteorango Kid hier gezeigt und diskutiert. Heute zeigen wir den wohl bekanntesten brasilianischen Film dieser Epoche, Der Heim Transi. Und Glauber Horsches Film hat eine große Bedeutung für die Filmgeschichte und hat großen Einfluss auf ihre zeitgenössische Filmproduktion in Brasilien geübt. Um über Der Heim Transi vorzutragen, haben wir heute die große Ehre, Professor Ismael Xavier aus Brasilien als Gast zu haben. Ähm, Professor Vincent Rediger ist hier und wird Professor Xavier zunächst näher vorstellen. Ähm, ich wollte nur hinweisen, also erstmal, ähm, ich wollte nochmal ähm, bei unserer Kooperationspartner mich bedanken, dem Institut für Theater, Film und Medien an der Goethe-Universität und dem Exzellenzklotz Normative Orders auch an der Goethe-Universität. Und dank dieser Zusammenarbeit haben wir auch die Möglichkeit hier, äh, diese freie Eintritt bei diesen Veranstaltungen zu haben. Also deswegen ist es eine sehr, auch ähm, eine wichtige äh, Kooperation. Ähm, ich äh, weise nur noch darauf hin, dass äh, nach der Lecture, wie immer, haben wir eine kurze Pause. Das Café oben hat noch auf, wenn Sie noch was trinken wollen. Dann zeigen wir den Film und haben wir im Anschluss eine kleine Diskussion mit Professor Xavier. Und da können Sie Fragen zum Vortrag oder Film beide noch stellen. Deswegen lohnt es sich auf jeden Fall, bis zum Ende zu bleiben. Ich sage nichts mehr an dieser Stelle. Ich wünsche Ihnen nur viel Spaß. Boa Palestra, bon Fiumi und bis demnächst. Yeah, danke, Laura. I'm going to switch to English, which uh, Ismail uh, told us is his second language, so um, I'm okay uh, speaking English here. Um, Teram Transe is not a film that belongs to the Cinema Marginal. Um, it's the topic of this lecture series, of course, is the Cinema Marginal and the Revolution of Cinema. But as Laura already said, and as Ismael Xavier is going to explain to us in, in uh, great detail, this is an absolutely seminal film in that historical moment in the cultural situation of Brazil in the late uh, 60s. It is a film that literally shook the earth and became a major reference um, uh, culturally in, in many ways for everything that happened uh, after the film uh, came out. <clears throat> Glaube Rocha, as those of you who followed this series will already know, he is of course the towering figure of Brazilian cinema and it is someone that all the directors of the Cinema Marginal had to position themselves uh, in relation to somehow. Uh, you remember Rogerius Ganzerlos way of dealing with uh, Glauber Rocha, which was a mixture of reverence and sort of trying to distance himself. Uh, and in many of the other films that we've seen so far, there are references to specific films or to Glauber Rocha as the filmmaker or as a cultural phenomenon. Um, someone that, that the, the Cinema Marginal um, filmmakers uh, greatly admired, but also uh, tried to position themselves to in, in uh, what was obviously also a critical way. Uh, so we felt it was imperative to have this film in the series because it is such an important point of reference, not just for Brazilian culture in general at that point, but also for the Cinema Marginal um, movement to the extent that it is a coherent movement. And we felt that we needed the best man to talk about it. And that of course is Ismael Xavier, who uh, I think can be aptly described as the doyen of film studies in Brazil. Um, Ismael Xavier has actually been a professor of film um, since at the Universidad de Sao Paulo, since 1971. He just retired last year, I think. No, it's more time. Five years. Okay, five years ago. So it's 65, not 70. Mind. Yeah, you, you still you continue to teach at the <laughs> Universidad de Sao Paulo. Um, he's the author of no less than 11 books, um, not just on uh, Brazilian cinema but and on Glauber Rocha, but also uh, on um, Griffith, uh, and early cinema, so uh, his uh, 
work really covers all areas of world cinema and of uh, film history. Um, and uh, the book on Griffith um, is indicative also of his trajectory as a scholar, because after he'd already become a, uh, a lecturer or professor of uh, cinema at University of Sao Paulo, he moved on to earn a doctorate at uh, New York University in, the ni in 1982, at a time when the film studies department at New York University was, was a really pivotal uh, place uh, for film studies. A lot of film scholars who went on to um, uh, determine the course of film studies in the US and worldwide um, over the next three decades up till now uh, were at NYU at that point, like Tom Gunning, who was your uh, classmate, basically. And uh, you, uh, we just talked about this, uh, had, a, had a joint seminar on early cinema and obviously shared an interest in, in Griffith. So Ismail has been part of that um, moment of ferment in film studies. And um, it's no coincidence then that he's been a guest professor pretty much all over the world. Uh, he taught at the University of Iowa, which is essentially the birthplace of film studies in the US apart from NYU. Um, he taught at NYU, at Paris 3, the University of Chicago, uh, Leeds, uh, so he's been around. Um, the one book that I want to specifically mention is Allegorias do Subdesenvolvimento Cinema Novo Tropicalismo Cinema Marginal, which uh, came out of the NYU dissertation and was published in English by University of Minnesota Press in 1997, and which of course was one of the key texts for us um, in building this program and in, in developing our ideas here. I'm very honored that you took the long trip from Sao Paulo here to tell us what the meaning of Teram Transe is. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening. First of all, I would like to thank, thank uh, Vincent Hediger for this invitation. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here in Frankfurt in this event to give this presentation on, in English, the translation is Land in Anguish. And, um, also, I would thank him for his very generous present introduction of my work, so it gives me a kind of responsibility after <laughs> your talk. Yeah. Okay, um, when uh, he was saying that really, I would refer to terra in transit, because it's, it's more appropriate, because the translation is not so okay. Um, it was a kind of, I, I said in my title, it's a shock experience uh, in Brazil for many reasons. And so I will go in certain detail in, in consideration of the film itself, because uh, I know that uh, we will have the projection. And so I'm not going to advance so much in my account of uh, the film in, the, in detail. You know. But uh, I will refer to some strategies that are a, a kind of trademark of this film in terms of his political engagement, in terms of um, changing a, a pattern in 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 what was you know the political cinema in Brazil, especially the Cinema Novo group. Uh, which was in the beginning of the 1960s very concerned with this idea of the intellectual as an artist that should be working all the time with the idea of raising consciousness in people. Yeah, this kind of pedagogical side of art in terms of the interaction with the audiences. And this film doesn't have, in certain ways, uh, this kind of concern, quite the contrary. And I think the people who later, with a kind of more experimental uh, strategy in terms of filmmaking, uh, took this kind of provocation, this kind of shock experience provoked by, by Russia's film, 
to change, you know, the the way they propose the interaction with the audience with a more, a much more aggressive uh, position, much more concerned with uh, not having a kind of previous contract with the audience in terms of a kind of smooth dialogue. Not a, and above all, avoiding the pedagogical kind of stand that some kind of political cinema, not only in that time, but you know, uh, in different moments of history, uh, had had taken. So um, I'd like to begin with this a kind of brief account of the political historical juncture at the time in which the film was made. The film was shot in the 1960s, and it was ready around the beginning of 19, 19, 19 sorry, in the 1966, and it was um, ready in the beginning of 1967. It was released in Brazil in May 67. And um, of course, it's a film made just after the the 1964 military putsch. And so the basic reference of this film, the basic topic uh, that it's uh, worked in the film is the process that led, the political process that led to this military, I, I say putsch in, in, in German, no? putsch, putsch. You know? Um, usually we use the golpe d'estado, which is the translation for coup d'état, the French expression. Okay, uh, uh, after a period characterized by an accelerated process of industrialization between 1955 and 1960, Brazil faced a severe political crisis between 1961 and 1964. A major confrontation took place when President João Goulart from the Brazilian Labour Party exposed his political program as placed as his central project <clears throat> that placed as his central project what he called the basic reforms program in Brazilian society and economic structure. This program placed the central government in open confrontation with conservative forces. Goulart was a politician who had come from the Brazilian South and had inherited a populist tradition begun by Getúlio Vargas, who had been the 1930 revolution major leader. And then Vargas, he, in 1945, he was, um, you know, he had a period of dictatorship in 1945, that term, uh, the in power ended, and we had a kind of redemocratization in terms of a conventional political process, but he was elected in 1950 again and had a new term as a president until 1954, in which a big crisis, a confrontation with conservative forces generated his uh, uh, suicide. And in some ways that suicide marked Brazilian politics after uh, during, you know, the late 50s and early 60s. And João Goulart was an inheritor of that um, political position, you know, that was emblematic, uh, represented by Goulart, uh, by Vargas. Okay. We can go to this kind of historic background later in our discussion. I will not go on with that, but I think I'd just like uh, to mention now that Vargas took a lot of legal measures to regulate labor contracts and the right of workers. And all those things that he did, you know, in both his terms as president, were only effective in the urban areas. Since, since the 1950s. They were not applied to peasants who lived in large land states not close to urban centers. 
this is uh, something that explains why when we look to Terra in Transi, we will see that uh, the major political confrontation that is uh, worked in the film is in a provincial side of uh, the political context in Brazil. And confrontation between a populist leader and uh, peasants uh, in all those kind of conflicts related to the property of land and the work conditions and poverty and even works that starved at a certain point. The Goulart's pros proposal of basic reforms included the nationalization of some multinational corporations that operated in strategic, strategic sections of the economy. For instance, in the production of energy, mainly in electric plants, because, you know, the explo exploration of petrol was already uh, nationalized by Vargas before that, in, when he created the Petrobras a state company. It also involved a financial reform involving new regulations for bank operations and the most explosive of all, the agrarian reform. In Brazil, the property of land was, and it still is, highly concentrated, a kind of heritage from the colonial times that was considered a major obstacle for economic development and for the improvement of the peasants' well-being. People from the Brazilian Northeast, especially, who lived in the countryside were extremely poor, in many instances facing hunger and the lack of any medical assistance. That's the reason why the agrarian reform, although an old topic of political discussion, was a central issue in the early 60s. In the overall, overall radicalization of the political crisis, landowners made their alliance with bankers and industrialists, financing campaigns against Goulart's program, accusing him of promoting the subversion of the Democratic Republic, as the so-called Democratic Republic. A whole set of confrontations led to the 1964 military putsch, when the president was overthrown and had to leave the country. After refusing all pressures coming from his supporters to resist to this military putsch, supported by big money and the conservative forces. Observance, observing that pace of right-wing conspiracy against Goulart, we understand why Global Russia in Terra in Transi, among other issues, gave much emphasis to this major sector of confrontation, the agrarian question in his account of the political pressure that led to the 19, 1964 putsch. Uh, cinema Novo, the new cinema, was an aesthetic and political proposal it started around the late 50s and early 60s, and its major development took place in the early, in this period between 62, 63, 64, exactly at this time of constant debate on the aberrant social, social inequality sustained by the social and economic structure of the country. And it correlates in terms of the power structure. Some well-known cinema novel films at that, of that period, uh, they gave special emphasis to this question of the the peasants, like, you know, Barren Lives, a film, a 60, 1963 film by Nelson Pereira dos Santos, Barren Lives, is a well, it's a film that uh, is one of the major films made in that period. Black God, White Devil by Russia, that was released in the beginning of 64, two weeks before the military putsch. And The Guns by Rui Guerra a film that was released only in 1965, with the print that Wigera didn't see as his own work. That was a, a conflict with his producer, etc. So these are the ones that were made in the northeastern countryside, in the dry land called Sertão, 
films that had a direct connection with the debate on the agrarian reform. Uh, I could also mention that Cinema Novo had a very strong connection in terms of inspiration with new realism, the Italian new realism and uh, the French Nouvelle Vague. And even in this context of the so-called modern cinema involving, you know, the after the war period, after the Second World War period, you know, the new realism and Nouvelle Vague uh, were considered two major you know, uh, movements that uh, created a kind of new atmosphere and also given conditions to the development of the author cinema against the more conventional industrial production, etc. And Cinema Novo was part of this. And within Cinema Novo, there was a group of uh, the so-called Godardians, the ones who had a very close connection with Godard, not personal, but in terms of style, in terms of inspiration, and the non-Godardians. Godard was part of the Godard. Uh, Glauber Horsha was part of the Godardians. Okay. And this is interesting to see because uh, we will see in his own style you know, many things that we can relate to Godard's style in terms of camera work, in terms of jump cuts, as they say in English, or the French call faux raccords, discontinuities, and also uh, some other things that are related to Godard. Uh, after the 1964 push, Cinema Novo changed his its emphasis, and after what has been a clear defeat of the left parties that gave support to Jean Goulart, like uh, the challenge, a film made in 1965, just after the coup d'etat, by Paolo Cesar Saraceni, uh, which dealt with the necessary autocritique that should be made by intellectuals and artists bringing to the screen the figure of the last leftist journalist, journalist and intellectual, who had coped with the new times and find, or not find, other ways to proceed in his political engagement. Terra in Transi gave continuity to that central role given to the journalist in the staging of the drama lived by intellectuals in their interaction with the political crisis, including their reaction to the military push. Within this context of Cinema Novo's painful confrontation with the hostile political climate set by the dictatorship, including censorship and other kinds of pressures, Terra in Transit had an enormous impact on the cultural production that involves cinema, theater, popular music, and visual arts. And I will try now to go to the film to comment on some of its strategies to explain why I refer to this shock experience. On the one hand, the film's impact was generated by the radical autocritique implied in its representation of the engaged intellectual and poet with the protagonist. Paulo Martins was not accepted as representing the leftist intellectual, given that he was far from acting as an organic intellectual. Organic intellectual, I take this expression from the Italian Antonio Gramsci, who had a sense of the intellectual who brings the light to the people, the one who, whose actions and words are controlled by reason, who has confidence in dialogue and always makes all effort to be coherent and clear in his or her proposed propositions, always analyzing what is at stake before taking action. Paulo Martins is the opposite, melancholic and skeptical as a poet authoritarian when dealing with the people, compulsive before any setback, with no discipline in his political action. Passionate, his personal style is captured by the mode of excess. Mode of excess is something that uh, permeates all 
aspects of uh, all strategy, everything in, in, in terra in transi. Uh, enfin, is capture, you know, his personal style is captured by the mode of excess that dominates the political theater in El Dorado. El Dorado is the allegorical country in which the story takes place. Because, you know, there is a question of censorship, but not only that. Because I, first I have to tell you that the allegorical strategies are something that uh, go on throughout Robert Russia's cinema, since his first film up to the end of his career. Even Black God, White Devil, who was made after, uh, sorry, uh, before 64, a film you know, shot in 1963, is completely allegorical. It's a different structure, it's a different kind of allegory. Uh, it's more related to a sense of understanding history as a series of articulated succession of advance and setbacks that have a kind of teleological framework that leads to a certain telos, a certain end. A kind of, let's say, in terms of, uh, it's a secular translation of uh, what is traditionally proposed in the Christian tradition, the idea of, you know, life and history as a path to salvation. The idea that there is a teleology, teleology in time and there is a kind of destiny uh, that, con that gives a figure you know, of our time experience and our destiny is in, in terms of a path to salvation. Um, his film, Black God, White Devil, is, is marked by an allegorical structure in which he takes uh, the history of the countryside in Brazil, the history of peasants' revolts, and he goes back to two emblematic moments of repression and massacre. One at the end of, 19, of the 18th century, the 18th, and one in around 1938, uh, 1940. And he takes those two events and condenses in allegorical journey of a couple of peasants who are the protagonists. And then they go through experiences that in history you know, were separated by 40 years. But in, in, in his allegory, you know, there is a, a journey that is accomplished by, you know, a couple of peasants in, in their own lives, you know, just a couple of years. And there are two experiences of defeat. And those two experiences of defeat are defined in the film in a way. You know, the narration gives a kind of framework in which it's possible at the end of the film see those two events as a prefiguration of or the announcement of someone, something that would accomplish in the future in the successful revolution. The idea of the revolts in history as even when defeated, they, they should, seen, should be seen as, this, as taking part of this process that leads to the future revolution. Of course, he's thinking of a socialist revolution when he made the film. He was thinking that. And so it's a 1963 film. It, it's a kind of allegory, allegory of hope based on this idea of a teleology. I saw it's, it's too, uh, too, too close. It's better now? Sorry. In fact, uh, this standing position, I'm, I'm not that <laughs> familiar with. OK. Um, <laughs> So this is one thing that I would like to, to mention. You know, it's not only the question of censorship that led Russia to allegory. It's the very structure of his thought and of his creation and, and of his aesthetic strategies to think about history. And this is, it changes the strategy, it changes the kind of allegory, but it's always something that is far from realism. In, Russia's cinema is always far from a realist 
position. For instance, I'm talking about a film that is, is representing, you know, a very recent political process, you know, that was lived in 62, 63, 64, and we made a film three years later. But the way he represents it gives a kind of resonance that goes beyond that particular conjuncture. This is typical of Russia's cinema. He goes beyond that particular time, which is there as a reference outside the film uh, to, to be uh, thought. I will mention the ways he does that. Well, I was talking about how uh, Paulo Martins, is a, it was a kind of very unpleasant mirror for intellectuals. Uh, another aspect of the shock experience was that uh, it had a strong impact on the artistic milieu as this impact uh, was generated by the way Russia gave a very singular inflection. inflection. Russia gave a very singular inflection to his representation of the political process, clearly based on the categories of the political economy, giving emphasis to class struggle, social inequality, and the role played by capital in the constitution, constitution of power. But when I say singular inflection, I have to specify now two sides of this singular inflection given by this kind of analysis of the political process clearly based on the categories of political economy. One side is the fact that the film incorporates that dialectical framework of political analysis exactly against those who consider themselves their legitimate professors. That is to say, the members of the Brazilian Communist Party. And he presents in his film a radical critique of the strategies chosen by the Communist Party and its allies. They had given all support to Goulart's populist style in, in his effort to improve the program of reforms. And this support, this is the central aspect, this support in part resulted from a controversial political analysis of Brazilian society and its elite. An analysis that implied a very, not only possible, but feasible uh, political alliance with the so-called national bourgeoisie, whose economic interests would lead rich, rich industrialists to work in favor of this program of reforms in the name of a national independence vis-a-vis the multinational imperial pressures. The ironic side of this critique comes from the way Russia, and here he was inspired by Bertolt Brecht. There are some passages in which the, the characters make comments and like kind of a side commentary uh, within the scene, or sometimes go to a clearly pedagogical moment that is, uh, has a kind of ironical flavor and one uh, and there are two two moments in which this occur uh, first russia enacts uh, a pedagogical dialogue involving a lesson on anti-imperialist national interests uh, a lesson that is given by the leftist intellectuals Paulo Martins, the protagonist, and his great friend Alvaro, when they convince Julio Fuentes. Julio Fuentes is the character who personifies this so-called national bourgeoisie. And they convince Julio Fuentes to support the populist leader in the film, Vieira. Vieira will be the, the character who personifies 
different kind of populist uh, leaders in Brazil, not only in Brazil. I will mention this. So this is the first moment of pedagogical lesson on political strategy and question of economic interests and politics. And later on, this uh, is a way to refer to this strategy coming from the Communist Party, was, which was involved in this idea of you know, the alliance of the rich people because of national interests against imperial powers, etc. And the second lesson we follow in, during the film is again given to Julio Fuentes. But now, it's a lesson on class struggle. And this lesson is given by whom? By the elitist conservative leader of the Putsch in Latin English, in Tahintransi, called Porfirio Diaz. So the, the character, the personification of a very conservative thought that gives this lesson on class struggle is not leftist intellectual, is the archi-conservative leader. This is one question related to a singular presentation of the way the film presents a kind of critical view of leftist strategies uh, before 64, 1964. The second side of the singularity now, the film's enactment of the political theater involving the central characters is embedded in an allegorical representation that, that brings a new framework to its political drama. Tarin Transi represents the very recent uh, political experience as taking place in an imaginary country, as I said, you know, called Eldorado. This symbolic name, well known in Latin America since the colonial times, gave expression to the Spaniards expectation in reference to the new world as a tropical dreamland, plenty of wealth, a view that gave strong impulse to the exploration of the territory by the conquerors during the first years of the colonial enterprise. Seen from the 1960s as perspective, that vision of paradise was a perverse counter image calling our attention to the unfulfilled promises of the new world and its net marriage history, dominated by the colonial and new colonial powers. This, this history has been punctuated by a series of episodes that require the mobilization of grotesque masks in order to be fairly represented on the screen. Taking the very recent 1964 Brazilian bad dream, Russia wanted to amplify the scope of his film, evoking other episodes of Latin American history in his allegory, suggesting similar patterns of political experience and cultural heritage. And this uh, reference to Eldorado is only one way of referring to something that is go beyond, goes beyond Brazil, and, and it's also something that has a kind of Latin American dimension. Another example is the name given to the conservative leader, Porfirio Diaz, was taken from a Mexican dictator, one of the major dom dominant political figures uh, of the late 19th century and uh, 20, uh, we're in the 21st century, late 19th century and early 20th century, um, who stayed in power 30 years, first from 1976 to 1980, then from 1884 to 1911 as a dictator. And he was only overthrown by the 1911 Mexican Revolution, the major political event of Mexican history in the 20th century. That revolution that in, endured almost 10 years of armed struggle in many stages ended up seen by historians as the unfinished revolution. That in that at its final chapter did not fulfill 
its promises. Other main characters also you know, are personifications of a social group, of a political force. They have names with the Spanish flavor, like uh, Julio Fuentes. It's a typical Spanish kind of name because in, in, even in the, in the way I'm, I'm uh, pronounced, I say Julio is more Spanish than Portuguese. It's all Julio in Portuguese. And also the populist Vieira, not only by his name, but also by his face, his style. He remembers uh, uh, Caudillo, as the Span Spaniards call, you know, from the south, from the Pampas, that has a connection with... Uh, Argentina and Uruguay. And Paulo Martins, there is a sequence in which he's called Paulo Martinez, giving more emphasis to this uh, reference to the Latin, Spanish American context. The only character that has kind of different uh, reference in, in, in her name is Sara who has a more biblical kind of evocation. And Sara is the Paulo's uh, companion, you know, the major figure in his uh, life. And she, as a woman, she is the voice of reason. Uh, Glauber uh, deals with this kind of stereotype of human uh, sentiments, uh, sentimental women, and sentiment and man and reason. No, no, he, there is an, an inversion of this kind of stereotype. And the voice of reason in the film is Sara. She is a leftist militant who personifies that figure that I referred to of the organic intellectual, always a mediator in the very unstable relationships involving Paulo, involving Vieira, and the most prominent group of young militants who support the populist leader. And there is another main character, uh, 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 the figure of a woman that is, I would say, the symmetrical mate, the symmetrical pair uh, uh, in connection with uh, Sara, is Silvia. Silvia is Paulo's promised wife in the days of his youth, when he was a Porfirio Diaz protege. And Silvia um, is the radical absence of voice in the film. That is a very clear, unrealistic kind of construction of a character. In, you know, while Sara is the voice of reason, Silvia has no voice. We will see that during the film. The imperial powers, the imperial powers that have a strong hand in El Dorado's economy and political process are kept from beginning to end out of sight. Not a face, not a body, not a personification as the other forces. Only an oral evocation made by other characters who mention the formula explint to refer to this imperial force, which is an abbreviation of Compania de Explotaciones, Explotaciones Internacionales, which is a Spanish uh, way of referring to Explore international explorations. It's not Portuguese, it's Spanish. Another thing that I will comment on now is the examples, the examples of a singular presence of the cultural reference in the enactment, enactment of the political process. It's interesting to consider here in more detail the opening sequence of Terra in Transi. It's a way of advancing some comments on the film without interfering that much on our experience of watching it. In fact, it's your experience of watching it. And without already anticipating what is more specific in the way the film's ending sets its overall view of the Brazilian political experience. 
El Dorado, the allegorical side, is introduced in the opening sequence as a tropical country, which, with its exuberant nature, inhabited by passionate characters who are involved in an intense political struggle. Uh, when I say that uh, land in English, in English is not a good transition, is because I have to specify that transe here is a state of being that refers to an intense experience of being possessed by an exterior force. Not only produced by hypnosis of being, but also produced in a religious experience. Of course, in, of this religious experience, the most direct reference comes from the ceremony of Candomblé, the Afro-Brazilian religion, when a person who come to, has come to consult the saints is possessed by a spirit who comes to bring not only the answer to his or her questions, but also to improve theatricality displayed by all those who take part in the ceremony. Well, let's uh, watch the opening, the opening sequence. We're going to see three clips uh, from the beginning of the film. I'm not going to show uh, the other parts, but I think it's interesting to give some images of refer that refer to what I'm I'm saying here because it becomes too abstract if I go on. Okay, uh, please, uh, Peter, uh, Hans Peter, please, uh, clip number one. It goes a little further, you know, when reaches the coast, we see a little of the land, and it's not only sea. You see that uh, he is introducing El Dorado, the allegorical country, with this uh, soundtrack, you know, the Afro-Brazilian music, you know, uh, a point sang by persons in, in ceremonies and the drums. And this will come back many times in the film. Russia Stai works some passages in his film as a kind of ritual. And his mise en scène is made of constant superimposition of different historical times. There is a sense of repetition suggested by the evocation of some central episodes of the conquest of the New World and the military and cultural domination, repression of the indigenous people that in inhabited the land and repression of the slaves who were brought from Africa. Uh, there is one interesting example of this kind of juxtaposition of historical times. Um, in a second sequence after uh, this opening shot that I showed you, there will come a moment in which they are all in a kind of terrace in the Vieira's palace. And the governor, Vieira, who is the candidate of president, for president, he is receiving the news of the, the putsch. And what is interesting in the film, that Russia doesn't bring uh, to the theater, the political theater, that um, is enacted uh, here, the military. There is no character representing uh, what was in the real 1964 putsch, uh, something led by the military. Here, there are very few references to, to military, for military forces. The whole thing is concentrated on this leader called Porfirio Diaz. Uh, this is a way to s create this kind of connection between what happened in 1964 and the whole heritage of the colonial times, uh, the entire you know, uh, 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 repetition uh, in terms of the power structure, uh, and this kind of continuity of the same kind of elite uh, that of people that are inheritors of the colonial power, 
which came from Europe and colonized the new land. So um, this is an interesting displacement. And uh, after the first sequence uh, in which the characters are involved in a kind of interaction uh, in a moment of crisis, that's interesting. We, we jump into, from this shot, we jump into the terrace of Vieira's palace and there is this kind of convulsive uh, reaction to the, not only the news of the putsch, but also the news that Porfirio Diaz is demanding Vieira's resignation and the whole political process involving his uh, um, his um, fight for presidency is over. The, the putsch eliminated all this process. So, and then there is Vieira's reaction, and reaction, a reaction that refers to João Goulart's refusal of resistance. And when um, Vieira uh, decide to give a kind of, to prepare a kind of speech to the country and ask Sara, who, who is his major assistant, to write what he will uh, say in loud voice, not so loud, but a very melancholic voice, we see Paulo Martins who arrives at a certain moment and he will comment each of the sentences as if it's a kind of aside commentary and he replaces the camera movements around the, the actors and the camera re remains uh, in a certain spot and it's and Paulo it will be the the figure who will go around the, the actor. So this we will we'll see very early in the film. And then when Vieira refused, he decided to, in a very personal and non-political attitude, he's, he goes to a confrontation, a kind of suicidal, suicidal confrontation. And he shot. And when he shot, uh, we have the beginning of his agony. And, and the whole narration will come from this character who is in, in about to die. So the entire film is narrated by Paulo's voice in commentary. Uh, coming from this moment, there is a very special moment, not uh, something that somebody is uh, remembering after the fact when there is time to be at home, at, there is time to go back to the past to present a kind of very rational um, thought and analysis of what uh, has uh, happened. No, no, it's, it's an agonic, agonic kind of uh, c character who will be all the time giving us this kind of retrospective. The, the entire film will be a flashback. And one thing that I would like to, to tell you is that this flashback uh, ends, up, ends up presenting what could be a kind of filmic translation of the free indirect style uh, in literature, in novels when there is a character giving his voice to the narrative, but the narrative not all the time is, me, is following the character's view, the character's perspective, uh, when the entire process is represented. So the free and direct style is a way of keeping a kind of ambiguity. And there is a narrator uh, a character within the story that narrates. He is the so-called mediator, but at the same time, there are many instances in which the narrative brings another perspective. And this passage from the character's perspective to a different kind of view of the facts is not announced, it's not clear. There is a kind of displacement uh, and, and this is one thing that Russia 
uh, works a lot during the film. So it's his flashback, but not all the times. It's his point of view. It's another's point of view, uh, which is uh, the framework of some passages. This is one example. The other thing that I would like to, to, to show is um, one of those instances of this kind of repetition uh, of historical time, this kind of uh, superimposition of the 16th century and the 20th century. Let's see uh, the number three. We go from one to three. We can uh, jump the second. We are not showing the second clip, just the third. Well, this is the first chapter, uh, which take us to this iconic figure of Porfirio Diaz. In his triumphal parade, he exhibits his insignias, a crucifix on one hand and a black flag on the other. And the next scene underlines the identity between this conservative leader of the 20th century and those who conquer the new land at the beginning of the 16th century. Wearing his 20th century suit, Diaz celebrates a ritual by which Terra in Transi evokes the first Catholic mass celebrated in the new land by the Portuguese colonizers in order to sanctify it. Around him, we see typical examples of masks that came out of a carnival parade. Figures that stand for a 16th century Portuguese or Spanish conquistador and a quiet Indian from a Tupi Guarani tribe. I say carnival masks because the two actors were very well known as those who in bourgeois clubs you know, participated in the contest involving who would bring the best Carnival, you know, custom, fantasia, as we call. Uh, and then we see both here you know, with their fantasies. Uh, one as a Iberic you know, colonizer and the other as the Indian. And the first mass is celebrated on the soundtrack of uh, Candomblé, the Afro-Brazilian religion which is a very ironic way to refer to some kind of um, re repetitive expression uh, referring to Brazil as the mixing of three cultures, you know, uh, the Portuguese, the Iberic, the, the white people from Europe, the black people from Africa, and the indigenous people. So it's a very strange, let's say, way of referring to this first moment of the colonization and presenting the conservative leader as the one who was already part of that. And then he goes and go up the stairs here. And at the top, he will uh, give his first speech, speech in the film, uh, in which he has this kind of Baroque sense of the powerful man uh, and as a person devoted to sacrifice. This idea of the tyrant and kind of a sacrificial figure uh, is also a kind of Baroque a statement by Russia. Diaz will always behave as something that was called to perform a mission that is a sacrifice to be uh, this kind of uh, tyrannic figure. At the end of the film, we will see. You know, no, I can't say that because we know that you know the the putsch is okay. He is uh, uh, wins. You know the process, and he takes office. He will be in power. And in the moment he takes office, you know, the whole celebration of this moment has again this mixture of time. He's with his modern suit, and at the same time, he, there is a crown. There is a coronation, as if he were um, 
a 16th, 17th century king. Uh, and then again, we have this reference to a cultural uh, context in which the whole political process is uh, uh, embedded. So Russia will all the time to call our attention to cultural references to say that they take part in this very recent process. And so in order to discuss in, in a more, let's say, effective way what happened in those years, in the 60s, we should think about Brazilian and Latin American culture and history and the formation of those nations, etc. So this is something that will bring culture all the time uh, and will establish this kind of allegorical strategy dealing with this imaginary country called El Dorado. This is one thing that is interesting to, to remember. The other thing that I would like to, to stress is the, the fact that uh, in Russia's you know, different kinds of allegory. I mentioned that you know, Black God, White Devil, made in 63, was an allegory of hope. And now, in 1967, you know, the representation of Brazilian history is seen as a kind of you know, disaster. We go from the allegory of hope to a kind of Baroque disenchantment. Instead of a teleology of salvation, historical time is lived as a journey lead, leading to disaster. There is a strong sense, very strong sense of catastrophe at the end of Russia's Baroque allegory. Of course, uh, some of the reference that we could bring here to talk about this Baroque allegory is uh, Walter Benjamin book on, on the origins of the German tragic drama. And also, another thing that we can bring as a reference is the way uh, Benjamin would say that uh, Terra in Transi is the representation of history as lived by the defeat. And I evoke here that moment in which he observes how the notion of progress in history, which is a secularization of the notion, uh, the Christian notion of history as a path to salvation, uh, is something that only could be conceived by the winners. Uh, and how the Baroque framework has a quite distinct view of history. And uh, not a journey as the promised land or a spiritual salvation, but as a disaster. The reference to Baroque allegory uh, that we can bring to talk about Terra in Transi does not necessarily imply that all critics in Brazil have Walter Benjamin, Walter Benjamin in mind. They may only be concerned with the film's mode of excess using Baroque in the sense of permanent tension created by the formal aggressiveness of the film, both on its visual stimuli and sound commentary. The mise-en-scene is always on the verge of the lack of control, displaying a formal tension on different levels. The handheld camera is almost all the time moving, making circles, sometimes approaching the actors in a kind of aggressive way in order to capture their facial expression or a gesture, sometimes going in one direction while, while the actors go into another, sometimes moving to the off-screen space. The, the, the montage, the editing, privileges jump cuts, discontinuities. And the soundtrack is a vigorous source of commentary on all the characters' actions and decisions, giving a special inflection to their frequent, frequent rhetorical statements. Aggressive, terra in transit sometimes is hard to watch. With an inflation of stimuli, many things happening at the same time. Uh, I will give a special emphasis at the, at the end when we discuss to a stra strategic scene of Vieira's rally when he is running for presidency. And then we have uh, in that same terrace that I mentioned uh, an entire scene that is ki kind of complex, has kind of a, 
a lot of things uh, at stake there. And uh, I just call attention to this, which is a sequence that comes uh, uh, close to the end, but it's, it's basic as a sequence that was quoted by people to discuss the question of the intellectual, the question of people, and the question of populism. And also, for instance, if you if take you know, the musician, the singer and composer, Caetano Veloso, who was one of the leaders of this tropicalist uh, um, turn in Brazilian popular music, just after Terra in Transi, because the whole thing of tropicalism in music and other arts started, except for the Helio Sica installation that was in April 1967 in the Museum of Modern Art of Rio de Janeiro. And Helio Sica's installation was called Tropicalia. And Helio Sica again, is another major source of many things that happened uh, from the April, May 1967 on in theater, in popular music, and in visual arts. So uh, one of the things that I mentioned is that Caetano Veloso, in his book called uh, The Tropical Truth, it's a kind of memory book in which he talks about his own experience. He mentions Tarin Trans, of course, but not only this, he mentions that sequence of the rally, the populist rally in Vieira's Terrace as a major shock for him in terms of his way of thinking, the connection between intellectuals and the people, etc. So one of the things that happened after Terra in Trans is this uh, critical view of that sense of a pedagogical intellectual raising consciousness. Uh, giving the light to the people. So um, when we have this kind of turn made by what was called later the marginal cinema, we have this turn from raising, raising consciousness to this aggressive interaction with the others, the provocation, um, the more, more experimental kind of film strategies, the formal invention as a way of giving a kind of challenge to the audience. And of course, also this in relationship with the kind of, 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 of scene uh, enacted in those films of the marginal cinema. This idea of abandoning this first pedagogical kind of illuminist kind of posture coming from the Cinema Novo project in the beginning of the 60s was uh, uh, abandoned in a way, was criticized. Uh, and the, the, that experience brought by Tarin Transi is one of the, the emblematic moments of this turn. Okay, so I just, I'm just before finishing, I would like to make two other comments and then we Well, okay, and it's, uh, uh, I'm talking about this aesthetic challenge uh, that underlines what a political disaster has to do with the grotesque, grotesque incorporation of cliches concerning Brazilian culture with Latin American overtones and its historical formation. I was talking about the way this incorporation of cliches concerning Brazilian culture is a decisive strategy in Terra Transi. But the form of this incorporation can be strange. Uh, but in this context of disaster, it refers to a very recent lived experience, still there in the heart of those watching the film, still very close indeed, and far from being funny. What has to be underlined here is that we can hardly say that there is any parodic impulse in, his, in its formal excess. It's not a kind of irony addressed to 
political forces in the sense of making a parody. It's this kind of uh, reference to cultural, to the cultural issues that has this more dramatic kind of effect. And in some ways, uh, considering that the experience of looking the grotesque face of fascism in the heat of the hour was a shock. In many cases, that shock had an effect of liberation for artists who gave a very creative answer to this film. In theater, popular music, as I said, reworking its iconography in the spirit of a collage pop, juxtaposing cultural cliches in kind of emblematic commonplaces about the happy tropical blast land to reach a critical effect, but now based in parody. This kind of enumeration of things, you know, that had this kind of parodic kind of flavor. Terra in Transit made clear the need for a radical change in formal strategies in the overall discussion of Brazilian culture and politics. One thing that Glauber, Russia, did not included in his work, not only in this film, but others, was a way to deal with the urban experience, the, the life in the big cities. And uh, especially the new trends of the media, ecology that was already showing its power. This new way to deal with the media, I say the way to deal with media ecology, is this, this kind of recognition of the place of media, and not only in culture, but in politics, every, in all dimensions of the social life, was something that came in this period of tropicalism and, and, and other kinds of concerns uh, in the artistic milieu in Brazil. Well, just to finish, I, I just say that, because that um, I went to some kinds of details because I think it's interesting to have this in mind, to keep uh, all the reference that I think are necessary to uh, evaluate this kind of shock experience that this film brought. Yeah? And we can also talk about what happened after this film. Okay, I think I think this is a sort of, I think I went too, too far in my half, how much I, I play, I talk for most, more than an hour, no? Sorry. No, it's this film that, you know, that all the time it makes me go on and on because it's really a lot of details that I think is interesting to bring to, to, to okay? And then we will have a discussion at the end. Okay, thank you very much and sorry for being too long in my presentation. It's not really late. But considering the that it's almost midnight, I think we'll take the time for a few for a few questions. Yes. Um, the, the the key claim that you made, and it's already in the title of your talk, of course, is that this is a, a baroque allegory of disenchantment, and uh, you you made a pretty convincing contrast open up a, a pretty convincing contrast between uh, 
um, Black Devil. Black God, White. Yeah, Black God, White Devil, and Terem Trans, uh, where he said, you know, there there was a, a Black God, White Devil is an allegory of hope, whereas this is an allegory of actually of the loss of hope or hopelessness. And um, there was one point that you made in your presentation that I want to pick up on. You said, um, this is a film about the feet. Um, and it's, it's, it has something to do, it, it's an allegory of a situation of the feet and of trying to deal with it politically, poetically, uh, historically. Um, and this is a point that I, <clears throat> that I'm particularly interested in because it is something that we touched upon in our previous discussions of, of cinema marginal films, um, where we actually, you know, in our last uh, presentation with Christopher Dunn, uh, we reached a point where he said, you know, there's, there's something like a culture of defeat in the cinema marginal. And there's a, there's an, an, an interesting book that was written by Val, um Wolfgang Schievelbusch, uh, a cultural historian, who's written a, a wonderful book about the train ride, but he also wrote a book about the culture of defeat. Uh, on, and he studied military defeats and their cultural consequences. And one of the things that he highlights is that um, part of the culture of defeat is a lot of dancing. You know, dancing. So <laughs> musical... Uh, uh, performances and dancing so the defeated nation or group uh, will revert to to weird rituals of, of trying to and and it's in that film and it's in all the cinema marginal films too so I just wanted to ask you if you could elaborate on that on that point of defeat yes uh, I think this observation about uh, dancing and in this film, also the question of ritual mm -hmm. is a body language uh, that is not realistic. You know, the actors have uh, they have a gestuality that it's symbolic. You know, mm -hmm. when they have conflicts, they don't really hit each other. It's mm -hmm. just a, a, a theatrical evocation of a gesture. No? Right. Or just and uh, the, the entire film is punctuated by. This idea of, uh, uh, I could say, theatrical genre. Mm -hmm. um, in many senses, for instance, you have this recurrent presence of the ritual of candomblé, the Afro religion in Brazil, uh, making a kind of comment on what we, we see. Even in some moments that might be seen as kind of uh, moments of hope, mm. and um, for instance, when we have that rally, the Vieira's rally in that terrace, mm. it's a very long sequence and very complicated. And, and I, perhaps we could make a comment later. Um, at the end, when finally Vieira recognizes that there is no way to stop their uh, political action and the option they they took and he says okay let's go on mm. and then paulo at that moment uh, of course he is kind of um, completely taken by that decision because in some ways it's uh, a moment of you know hope and seeing things going in that direction he wants and mm -hmm. then he the actor you know uh, he leaves the scene and he starts going looking at the infinite like mm -hmm. you know seeing what could be understood as the future mm -hmm. but then uh, we have again this uh, soundtrack evoking uh, trance mm. evoking this Afro-religion ritual and and in a way it's a comment that even when he's not you know having any kind of choreographical behavior because you know choreography is all the time in the sense of uh, 
uh, stylized gestures that uh, in all moments of conflict we have this kind of uh, um, becoming a ritual, not really a, something uh, of a realist kind of uh, confrontation. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, uh, Paulo's poet, poetry is a poet of defeat all the time, talking about uh, decay, about, in German is Vernunft, ne? Vermis. Uh, the small, huh? Eh? Vermont. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, then, uh, well, I don't know. And a lot of, of uh, reference in his poet, and also when we see Diaz talking about uh, life, it's always the sense of death mm. presence. The, the life as uh, a way to go to the encounter of death. Mm. And everything is decay. You know, people devouring each other, is, you know, all kinds of creatures from nature. Uh, devouring, devouring uh, people. So it's all uh, a sense of a natural process, uh, more um, uh, described as a constant fight and death. Mm -hmm. And um, this is also could be seen as a culture of defeat. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is this sense of um, the dialogue is very rhetorical, you know, as if the, the excess of gestures and the excess of, of words, because mm. people talk a lot all the time, with a lot of nonsense, with a lot of just, you know, uh, a kind of, uh, of speech, uh, which the, the, we could see a meaning in it as just, you know, trying to escape from the real question. Mm -hmm. So all this excess of body language, words, etc., is a confession of impotence. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, the, the idea of impotence is, is also, you know, it's a you know, certain way a culture of defeat. Right. There is only one thing that it's uh, at the end, the very end, when Paulo is uh, hit by those. It's not an army. It's it's a policeman from mm. you know uh, road. It's uh, yeah. Petro, yeah. uh, and and then he he starts. Uh, having this kind of final imprecation. Mm. He starts, uh, it's kind of, how far can we bear that? How far can we accept that? How far, and, and, and starts talking about all the rhetorical connections that uh, are all the time present in terms of, of, uh, of political discourse, etc. So that imprecation could be seen as a kind of last, reaction, mm. uh, last kind of active attitude. But this ad active attitude is just a, uh, again, uh, uh, a last sense of, of impotence that mm. is there, you know, because there is one of the things that uh, uh, provoked a lot of comment uh, when the film was released was this idea of, of an end idea that something ended and we don't know what will comes next. This idea of nothing seen in the new future that could change things. Uh, this idea of really, again, the culture of defeat, I think, is, is very strongly there in this kind of absolute disaster. There is no sign of any future. I mean, the, the Brazilian state motto is Ordem e Progresso, which is, <laughs> which is what it says on the flag. And this is anything but the flag. You know, yes, it's the yes it's all because, you know, the, that flag is, was created in the proclamation of the Republic. And the Republic was a, an act, again, a military putsch inspired by a group of uh, not only officers, but also some intellectuals mm. with a 
very strong influence uh, of positive mm. positivism you know the idea of order and progress right, together yeah. you know you know they they were people who who read uh, Conte in right. the French uh, uh, ideologue of this idea of order and progress, etc. So it was, it's, it's interesting the fact that at the same side you could see this kind of positivist inspiration mm -hmm. and all kinds of rhetorical creations related to a mythical nature, mm -hmm. a mythical word, uh, world, uh, and this idea of celebration of the tropical nature mm. uh, was there too, very strongly. Yeah. You know, there is one line in the national anthem that was composed at that same time in the late 19th century mm. when the, the Republic came in 1889 that says, lying eternally in an explained cradle, the country, right. to the sound of the sea to the light of the profound sky. You see, everything is related to yes. this celebration of nature in a mythical sense. Yeah. And at the same time, in the flag, there is order and progress, you know, the positivist uh, yeah. lemma. Yeah. So, uh, and I think the film deals a lot with this kind of excess of words, excess of gestures. That, that's why I, I say anything in the mode of excess. Yeah. It's everywhere, mm. and even the film itself, in some ways, you know, uh, uh, um, incorporates in its own style mm. um, the kind of discourse uh, which, in some ways, is criticized uh, all over in the mm. film. It's kind of a uh, omnipresent um, ritual rhetoric and a sense of this kind of excess as a culture of defeat, or mm. we could say culture of impotence, you right. know, just a kind of compensatory yeah. energy, mm. you know, um, that is driven to, to just a, an address to no one, in a sense. Yeah. I mean, that's, you, you pointed out how bad a translation um, land in anguish is for no in English no the, yeah, the title English, in English yes, yes. but, but uh, it entirely misses the point because yes. uh, it's it, trans it, it's it's trans is what it is about yes you know it's trans rather trans. than historical consciousness yes, yes. For, yeah and and, and the, even there is a scene in which even Paulo says the trans of mysticism we are all involved in this trans and. The soundtrack is all the time and keep making this kind of comment. Um, and what is uh, interesting is the fact that the idea of trance is not there because we could see some time of some kind of critical view of religion mm. in general. You know, uh, it's more a a, a sense that. Um, you know, that moment, that historical moment was uh, characterized by the fact that everybody was possessed by a kind of external force, by a, by a kind of, um, of alien presence that would uh, make people unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Because except for sometimes Sarah, as I told, yeah. uh, <clears throat> All the the dialogue, all the, the the things that people bring to in their defense or in their proposals, uh, yeah. it's always a kind of excessive rhetorical mm. statement, uh, and sometimes, of course, uh, mixed with uh, very down to earth <laughs> observations, mm. as in that case of the two lessons that I had right. uh, referred to and. It's so funny the, the the lesson that Diaz, you know, the conservative leader, gives to Fuentes about you know class struggle, right. and he calls, "Listen to me, you're an idiot. <laughs> class struggle exists, and <laughs> what is <laughs> what is your and, class? And you're not going to be the winner of it. <laughs> yeah. And what else? Um, 
one of the things about that rally that I mm. mentioned a lot is the fact that we, we see that kind of carnival, that theatrical performance, a mm. collective theatrical performance, that is the only kind of performance that uh, uh, happens uh, in the open air scenes, mm. in the sense that uh, um, the people is there only to follow the leader, mm. to acclaim the leader. his proposal. Uh, uh, anytime you have some kind of a dissident behavior is immediately re repressed. And uh, that carnival that we see in that terrace and that the old politicians with that incredibly rhetoric rhetorical discourse talking about progress, opening roads in the forest, uh, taking, you know, rich metals from the, the soil, etc. He is, he comes with this kind of progress that is there in, in some ways, but given to it kind of a mythical uh, version. And when um, that sense of uh, disorder uh, 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 goes to a very high level, the soundtrack changes uh, uh, abruptly. We have the the carnival. The, the carnival is replaced by uh, a moment of uh, Eitor Villalobos yeah. music, and is a one of his pieces. He has a group of of, of compositions called Bachianas, uh, as a clear reference to Johann Sebastian right. Bach, and the cello comes very strongly uh, in a Bacchiana, uh, from the Bacchiana. Uh, and we go to an inner speech, Paulo's inner speech. We, 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 we completely go uh, away from that atmosphere of the rally and goes to his uh, inner experience. And then he starts talking about the idea of death, the death is the major uh, point. And when he talks about death, he talks when he says, this people doesn't believe in anything. This people can't believe in anything. Uh, what this people need is death. Mm. Uh, death uh, which um, generates, you know, pain uh, and all uh, at the same time generate some kind of active reaction. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea of, um, let's say, um, in some sense, uh, arm, armed struggle mm -hmm. uh, is in some ways uh, inscribed in some kind of ritual sense of this um, necessity or this need for that as a sacrifice, not as a result of some kind of real struggle. Mm -hmm. And when he talks about this um, idea of death as a sacrifice, um, in some ways he gives to his own claim for resistance, mm -hmm. for revolution, for armed struggle, um, the same kind of sense. Mm. Uh, for instance, when in the beginning uh, of the film we we jump to Vieta's uh, uh, Vieta's palace and you have this terrace and people are receiving the news mm. of the of the putsch. Uh, when Paulo arrives, he, he got. I forgot the point I was talking about, uh, the, the idea of violence. Uh, the, the idea of violence yeah, and that, that yeah, is yeah, imprecation yeah, of death is yeah, really... Yeah. And uh, then is, when, when the Paulo comes... Is, yeah, is the idea of resistance is the notion of death. Uh, uh, he, uh, the first thing he does, because there is one guy with a gun. We see gun the camera away. is giving a lot of emphasis to that gun in the hands of one of the 
Vieira's uh, staff staff yeah. members, and, and then he first thing he does is to take mm. this gun, and it, with that gun he he just throws the gun in Vieira's hands, and Vieira <laughs> gives back, right. gives back, and at that time he is of course uh, with this gesture of uh, arm struggle, and then he goes. Uh, with that gun in his hands up to the end mm. in all his agony his with that gun is kind of a choreographical way of dealing with it mm. and the whole gestures and he doesn't die in the film he just yeah. goes on in that the gun yeah dance with the gun and some people mm. at that time came with this idea that uh, that final shot in which he is there with that evolution with the gun would be a kind of statement asking for armed struggle yeah. Yeah. yeah okay but this proposition of armed struggle mm -hmm. it's not a political action based on a strategic reasoning mm -hmm. based on a sense that uh, that is the way to go on and try to do something no no is uh, a kind of demand for sacrifice. Mm. He I mean, goes the, to this kind yeah. of ritualized sense of death and ritualized sense of violence and the idea of sacrifice. Yes, I mean, the we, we need to go to questions from the audience, yeah. but but I think the the, the the framing of the last shot mm -hmm. is is very clear about that. I yeah. mean, it's it's yeah. a white guy and he's dancing with the gun or you know con completely isolated. Yeah. And he's completely isolated. So that that is not a uh, 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 shot that calls for organized yeah. political struggle. Yes, yes. Do we have questions from the audience? Anyone want to jump in and raise a point or two? Yes, please. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, Yes, thank you very much for your uh, introduction and also uh, your really interesting observations. Now it's it's re you really know so much about this film. It's quite fascinating to listen to you, um, and the film, of course, was also really fascinating. Um, and there is so much in it, and I have a lot of questions, but I try to <laughs> just ask one now. Um, so in the beginning, you said that um, this film was not received uh, as a kind of uh, parody. Um, and you you uh, you emphasize this point, um, and of course uh, I believe you. But still, I had the feeling that some in some moments. I mean, I'm uh, for me from my point of view now, uh, which is a different point in history, of course. And I don't, uh, you know, I'm connected to this film in in a very different way than the audience then. But I have the impression that some of the, uh, I mean, there were some parodistic elements in it. Um, especially when, when with the elections, but also maybe even in the end. I mean, some of the things were just so over the top, and especially with the music uh, accompanying also these shots, uh, it did seem to have some parodistic elements, although it wasn't funny. Uh, and then, on the other hand, there were also so many shots where the people were um, laughing in this sort of uh, grotesque way, um, and I was just wondering about these elements, what, what you think about them and what uh, what they do to the film as a whole from your point of view. No, you, there is one thing that I, I agree with you. There are moments in which there is this parodistic flavor. But what is interesting, in, in for instance, one of the very long uh, passage uh, uh, in which we can find this, uh, and it's funny in some ways, is uh, the first time we see Vieta's campaign. And then when we go from the terrace, terrace, when they are talking about Sara, Paulo and Vieira are just completing their conversation about, um, you know, Vieta's uh, campaign. Just in the beginning of uh, Paulo's um, direct collaboration with Vieira and at that point uh, we cut to Vieira's campaign and then there is a music 
a kind of that reminds you of a kind of a band of a circus, a kind of uh, uh, with a we say trombone in trombone, uh, you know the kind of sound and the, there is a march there and that march is a musical version with no words but you can recognize uh, the lines of a romantic Brazilian poet Castro Alves uh, who wrote those lines in which uh, uh, no not national and uh, said by by Sara and by Vieira about the, the poet uh, the square or the, the the we could say the streets belong to the people as the sky belong to the condor a bird in, in German is condor so the, this metaphor of you know the square belongs to the people as the sky belongs to the condor um, and then um, there is a comment um, this was said by the poet who was uh, in favor of the liberation of slaves yes he was an abolitionist you know this poet so there was a reference to that and the, if you look at the rhythm of those lines they correspond to the music that we listen when we you, you see this uh, first moment of campaign uh, and it's funny because this kind of music it seems like a circus let's say like a, a, a theater not to be taken uh, in face value but at a certain moment the camera goes very close to Vieira's face and Vieira's in some ways this is a very kind of some seconds uh, he goes away from that theater and you see that he's thinking and his face uh, have a different expression for some seconds uh, when it's very clear by this kind of and then he he is in this, that same kind of mood that Paulo was in the other rally in which, you know, the Villa Lobos song comes and Paulo, and then we goes to Paulo's inner speech. Here we don't go to Vieira's inner speech because Vieira has a different position in regard to the narration process. But we go to that moment in which it's clear that Vieira knows about this theatricality of the campaign. So in some ways, you know, if, you, if we have some kind of uh, critical view based on a kind of um, parodistic construction of that uh, kind of political action, in some ways, uh, when Vieira um, have this kind of distance from that uh, and very clear uh, demonstrates that uh, he's, he is uh, as conscious, conscious of that kind of um, comedy uh, as we spectators of the film. So gives a kind of different emphasis because usually in parody, you know, let's say the victim of the irony is unconscious about uh, his or her own theater. But in Vieira's case, you know, he's very conscious about this comedy. And he behaves really obnoxious. He's obnoxious in the way he behaves. It's a kind of exaggerated. And when you could see, oh, okay, he's making a parody of a, a populist. Okay, but, but no, because it's not funny. Because what is implied in that moment is that, no, no, they are very conscious about this, so they know about the comedy my, much more than we know. So we can't take them as uh, you know the, our target in this comedy because uh, it's not, on their view, something serious. So um, 
and this is something that happens sometimes in the film. You're right. There are a lot of there is a lot of irony. For instance, when, for instance, um, Julio Fuentes answers to Diaz, "No, I'm a leftist." No. At that point, I think uh, it's a it's a comedy there that is played by uh, unconsciously by by Julio Fuentes. Uh, so. Um, but what I, I, I was saying when I, in my presentation is that at that time, it was very difficult to have this kind of reaction. I, I agree with you. Even me, when I see some of the sequences, I say, no, it could be a, a parody. But at that moment, at the height of that moment, you know, it was very recent, everything. And, and things were happening, you know, the idea of torture, the idea of people being people being repressed and killed was there in '67. We were we were living the military dictatorship. So it's an incredible the fact that this film was made in, in this time, at yeah, this time. I think also Paolo, I think it, it, it says it at some point where uh, where he says that uh, there can be many jokes made in this tragedy or something. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that was the right translation, but so s somehow maybe there was also a consciousness of the, uh, I mean, that just to like yeah. support your view yes, that, yeah. that the characters in the film are um, aware of this sort of like yeah. uh, satire or parodistic element yeah. that they're embodying. Yeah. yeah so. But I mean, I, I think this is a, a really fascinating uh, question and an important question, and, and you just, I mean, the, the analysis you just uh, gave us of the scene, I think, is absolutely brilliant. Um, and it makes makes me think that, in a way, it can't be parody, it can't be satire. It's also not dark humor, um, because that requires a coherent moral horizon. Any of these modes require a frame of reference something in the name of which you can parody or satirize that which you satirize. But what you just described is sort of a performance that has a, a, a glimmer of consciousness about the theatricality of it all, but at the same time they are performing the populist political movement. So, so it's, it's a part of that, you know, hopelessness. Uh, there is no outside, there is no point of reference in the name of which or, or your horizon of progress towards which you could improve the world, you know, um, and and so I think that that the mode in which that particular form of almost parody but not quite parody, and almost satire but it's not really satire is enacted is absolutely key to to the allegory mm -hmm. uh, of of hopelessness. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have more questions? Yes, please. Or a split second faster than the yeah, lady to Rosa. Yeah, um, Yeah, uh, I was wondering just about the contrast between these two uh, leaders, right? Between Diaz and Vieiras, because Vieiras uh, seems to me so um, lacking, like uh, charisma. So this problem of charisma, I think, plays a very important role. And at the end, uh, the, the the other one, which seems to me to be very charismatic in contrast to this other one who is always dressing in white or well it's a white and black film but the fact of this of his way of uh, wearing uh, this uh, yeah colorless suit mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean there uh, there was something that i had like in mind the whole the, the whole film uh, would you have something to say about that yeah, you, you can uh, see something related to one of the things that uh, was related and sometimes also even now is the idea of a kind of suit that is more uh, adapt to the tropical climate than the, the dark suits because of the sun. The white clothes in some ways is a reference to a tropical weather. And he is also... Hmm. Yes. Yes, it's part of his theater. 
he's part, he's, you're right. He's part of his uh, image as a person who does that, but at the same time, uh, sometimes he's carried out, but he's on theater, like when he is defeated at mm. the end, in, 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 at the final moment of his confrontation with Diaz. Uh, that confrontation is not uh, enacted in a realist way, you know. Instead of uh, uh, military putsch, putsch, we have this uh, battle of discourses. Mm. And the ass is uh, going up. This is it's a kind of going up and up, up to the high of that hill. In, and he's always alone. And he's always talking about... Uh, the enlightened mornings that are coming. He's, he is the the ironic embodiment of hope in that absolute sinister sense of hope that he carries. Mm. I think While the other is going, his discourse is weaker and weaker. In we get to a moment in which he down he is down on his knees, uh, and then the priest comes and he kisses the hand of the priest. It's a kind of theater of impotence, while Diaz, you know, is the theater of a powerful figure uh, and always alone. Yeah, I mean, what, what puzzles me is uh, that I ask this question with the background that I come from South America. And there, the history of these countries, mm. Colombia, but Venezuela, and all other countries, tells us that there is a history of, or a tendency to dictatorship, to 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 electing a dictator, to to being fascinated by by it, mm -hmm. Chavez or Uribe in Colombia or whatever. So uh, this this polarity between populism on the one side and charismatic on the other is very very complicated yes when you right. get a leader like chavez or yeah uribe which are were very charismatic in contrast to others like maduro or whoever uh, okay and also the question about uh, uh, hilma so what's happening in in brazil at this moment seems to me to evoke again this uh, what's puzzling to me about this film is that it, tell, it speaks allegorically about a history that is not in its end, that it's always coming back, and it's very mm. present. Yeah. Right. That's why I was talking about the sense of repetition that is really an insistence. He insists all the time, the sense of repetition. Until when? Until when is this is going to happen? You write about this um, climate. For instance, uh, when we... Because this film was made 50 years ago, so there was this kind of celebration of the 50, 50th anniversary of the film. And uh, I was in two uh, the debates, and we were talking about how in Brazil today we have the same process, you know, uh, uh, but in a way, you know. Just to to be brief, you know, quoting Marx, you know, history repeats twice. The first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. We are now in the second moment of farce. Complete. It's amazing. Mm. I, I I haven't seen in my life so cynical enactment mm. of this farce. It's amazing. It's uh, there is no concern for any kind of disguise. Things are blatantly open. Mm. No, and so the fast is there, and and it's working, it's going on, mm. and this is something that you're right. It, you have always this repeated process, and uh, and now we are. I mean, I, I can just report that we've had that reaction before to to other to cinema marginal films. Um, I remember when we screened the uh, Bandido de Luz Vermelha. That's uh, there was uh, uh, a young man from Brazil in the audience maybe in his late 20s, and said, well, thank you for screening my favorite film, and by the way, Brazil is still the same mess. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> um, uh, so there, there seems to be some you know, yeah. tragedy uh, and force uh, uh, cycle. If, if I may just uh, uh, you know, come back to your point very briefly, I think the question of dress is really 
important. I mean, one of the reasons why this is such a good film is that it excels at what makes a good film. It's very well cast. You know, the, the, the choice of actors is uh, astounding. Yeah. I think the Dios, the, the, the actor who's, who plays Dios is just perfect for the role. They're all very, very good. And uh, as you said, you know, the acting, uh, the, 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 the way, the, the, the soundtrack is very sophisticated. But costume is also very sophisticated. Yeah. And, and I think you're right to point out yeah. the, the question of the white, white dress. He's, he's sort of, he, he dresses like a 19th century character, late 19th century. He's out of his time. Whereas Dios wears these super expensive business suits and in the final scene combines it with, with uh, monarchical regalia, you know, the, the fur and all, all of that stuff. And, and those are very precise choices, yes. I think. Mm -hmm. Right. Please. Yeah. Yes, uh, <laughs> I have a little bit of an aesthetical question. I was very intrigued by your remark in the pre-talk uh, because this is uh, a movie uh, that uh, explores so much of this excess uh, mode and also Hosh's aesthetics is a lot about that. But you mentioned that he didn't uh, use the the ecology of media that that was arising at that time. And I would just like to hear a little bit briefly about that and also about like uh, how cinema marginal uh, reacts to to this movie and to this absence of the use of this. Media. Yeah, there is one moment in which the media appears, in which you know Fuentes is the owner of everything, and including the media, and and then uh, the way to attack the ass is through the media, and Paulo is the director of the program, and so you have the melodramatic conflict when Paulo fin finally uh, has his rupture with the ass. It's it's a kind of opera scene, including with Vergi on the soundtrack. And of course, there is a moment in which the media appears in a way that you know it's there. Everybody knows that you know the media and is uh, and its power in the political process. But one thing that you don't see in in this film, and also perhaps only in Cancer, that is a film he made in '68. After this, and he shot in '68, but only finished in '72. Uh, when he was for a long time out of Brazil, he he went to Europe in '69 and and stayed out uh, up to '76, and he made some films. Uh, and one of the things he did was to finish Cancer, in which he talks. He goes uh, in Rio, etc. In in this film, it's amazing. You don't see the city. There is one moment in which Paulo is walking in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, uh, and also there is one moment of a rally that uh, Russia took advantage, but uh, uh, in 66 he had made a documentary in the Northeast you know, of um, uh, a political campaign uh, by... Um, uh, oh, God. Uh, the Brazilian president, the first in the New Republic. Kubitschek? No, 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 no in, uh, in 85. Uh, I, Sarney. Yeah, yeah, okay. Sarney. Sarney was a incredible, you know, um, leader in the Northeast, uh, in this kind of what we call the the corral, the electoral corral, you know, there's a family that has a kind of dominant presence in a, in a region and they command everything. And Sarney was, uh, and his family were the owners, I would could say, of the political life in Marignan, who is in the Northeast. And, and he was invited to make a documentary on Sarnay's. Documented Sarney's campaign in 60, 65, 66. And he did. He didn't make the film that Sarney wanted. Uh, and that first rally that we see, that is a only realist uh, documentation of a lot of people in the square, and you, you have the, um, the footage that, um, that he had used in, in his film on Sarney. Um, he had this part and he was able to use it. That's the only time we see a real city 
And the other time is when Paulo is alone, when he goes back to El Dorado, etc. When he first time in Alecrim. But usually, you know, uh, it's an indoors film. You know, mm. Because the political, that's the other Baroque side, mm. you know. The political decisions and the political process is lived indoors. A, a small group of people belongs to the circle of power. They decide everything. And also, the major event in political life is treason. Mm. It's like a Shakespearean mm. play, you know. So, a lot of treason and a lot of indoors politics. And when you mm. go to the open air, it's just to acclaim, to be acclaimed by the people. Mm. This is another Baroque part of it. And, and so what you, you do have is this... Uh, this... Um, constant um, theatricality with different kinds of mo moods. Yeah. Even sometimes parody, but usually what you do have is this sense of, uh, it's not a tragedy, it's more a, uh, because there is no, uh, because tragedy needs a, 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 a potent lead uh, character, protagonist, you know, mm. a tragic character, he acts, he does things, and he, he goes to a certain purpose, mm. And he has some force to make things happen. And among the, those things, you have this turn of the mm. tragic uh, uh, ending of, of, of his... Uh, all the tragic characters, they, they have some kind of uh, serious uh, power. Mm. And they have, they have energy, they, they're able to do things. Uh, what you have here is more the sense of, all the time, the sense of disaster. Nobody mm. really, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, the characters that we, you would see as tragic, uh, there is no the sense of, of uh, uh, despite the fact that Paulo, in his poet poetry, he's all the time remaining, uh, evoking tragedy, this is mm. tragic thing, tragedy here, tragedy there, but it's not a, None of them a tragedy. Really this film is not a tragedy. It's a, that's why I say it's a Baroque drama. Mm. If, if I may pick up, uh, quickly pick up on one of the things that you just said to uh, connect it to the question of the media ecology, um, you, you were talking about the fact that this is very much a sort of a Shakespearean dra drama of treason that plays out indoors and that indoors is, is really important. And um, I mean, the, the media of course play a role, but the way they're referred to is sort of, on the one hand, obliquely. I mean, there's the meeting on the terrace of the building that belongs to Fuentes and there's the the, um, tower, isn't it? the tower, the 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 broadcast tower. And there's this incredible shot taken from the broadcast tower looking that back down on, on the terrace, but that's about the extent of it. And then there are the newspaper um, uh, editing the staff rooms, but there again, it's an indoor situation. So we don't have any of the aesthetics of the newspaper, none of the drama of producing a newspaper, um, no broadcast programs. So in a way, the, the media do not aesthetically interfere with what the film is doing, which is very different from what Rogerio Sconzello oh, yeah. is doing. Um, or from, you know, uh, Jairo yes. Ferreira. The, the narrators in Rogério Gonzalez's yeah. film are the radio voices. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's also a, a discourse from defeat. Right. And he, he even is, he, he makes a kind of self-parody uh, when he says, uh, when we, we can't do anything, we just, uh, how I can translate what he says in German? We... Well, I would say we make ours, we make idiot of ourselves. Uh, it's not what he says in Portuguese, but I don't know how to translate. Make fools of ourselves. Avacalhar is a, a Portuguese word that I don't know how to translate. Uh, perhaps uh, you can translate. Laura. <laughs> Avacalhar. Avacalhar is to make an idiot of yourself, to, to just uh, demoralize yourself. And there is a moment in which he says, when we can't do anything, we demoralize ourselves. Yeah. 
and it's a discourse of defeat, and but with this kind of uh, parodic sense, yeah. you know? and uh, it, it, and Bandido is all made as a parody of you know a film noir, quotations from Wells, science but, fiction, science fiction, and radio voices are the narrators there, not the poet here. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we have we have another question. Well, look. Uh, yeah, it's it's getting. No, for me it's okay. I'm responsible for part of the the problem of the, <laughs> the, the fact that we are here now, so I have to stay here. It's a very nice problem to have. <laughs> uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I have a question concerning um, the character of Paolo and how um, there's how the film deals with politics. Um, my question is, well, Paolo, he, he isn't quite, he isn't really a social revolutionary. He's just, he, he um, the reason he, he does what he, he uh, what he does is um, not some sense for social injustice or s such problems, but um, more a kind of aestheticism and boredom, basically, or that he doesn't know what to do with himself. It's, he, he I think he well, he seemed to me like um, yeah a, a figure of decadence and of of um, basically of yeah a, a mixture of nihilism and ex bad existentialism or something like that. But um, that's the one as aspect. But on the other hand, there's also this um, the symmetry with Diaz, which is um, quite outspoken when. Uh, I forgot who said it, but when when someone accuses him that he's just a, a bad copy of of Diaz, and um, and there there are this this um, similarities like this fascination for the historic moment and the great task and uh, things like that, um, and that's the one side. But at the other hand, there's still this concrete critique of strategies of the of the left like um, um, this idea of of um, mobilizing national unity against the uh, the foreign oppressors that uh, beats back against the left and I wasn't quite sure how this um, two elements relate to each other and uh, yeah and I'm, I'm very interested in this in this um, characterization of Paolo as uh, this kind of aestheticist? Yes, there are two things. I, I think you're right when you talk about this aestheticism. I think, uh, you know, in his poetry, you've, you sense a lot this kind of uh, self-reference and a sense of fighting against decay, fighting against all kind of deterioration or self-destruction, etc. Uh, but there is one moment in which uh, there is a, uh, a very fast but a very clear statement about um, the, let's say, the, I would say, ideological in the sense of false consciousness uh, that Paulo carries about himself and about um, what is around him in the political game. Uh, when in the last sequence we have the coronation and Diaz uh, is there in that ceremony and there is a very fast editing uh, alternating, you know, Paulo and Sara together on the road and when she asks him, what does your death mean? And this question is presented twice. The first time the question is presented to him is in between this kind of alternation. We are seeing the Ask Coronation and we are seeing both together on the road. And when she asks him, what does it mean your, your death? He answers, triumph of beauty and justice. Exactly when he says the triumph of beauty and justice, 
there is a shot in which, as part of his, what could say, delirium, delirium, in which he invades the palace and goes and Diaz is killed. This kind of uh, moment in which there is this uh, um, dream of going there and, and, and killing Diaz. We see him going up, going, no, he's kind of like this. He's lying on the stairs and he's uh, going up like this with his hands. And we have again that kind of imprecation in the beginning, from the beginning, in which he is always talking, ah, oh, we are weak, we are people without force, people, decadent people, etc. And then this time again he says, until when we're we gonna be that, until when, until when, etc. And when there is this kind of imaginary uh, uh, execution of, of Diaz, who kills Diaz? That peasant that was, no, not that worker who was killed during the rally. The same actor playing that work worker in the rally that is killed when he says no he's not uh, uh, people's representative you know he talks uh, as if he were representative of the people he's not because the people is me and then uh, paulo goes and put his hands on his mouth and and says that he's stupid uh, depoliticized uh, and and then he he looks at the camera and says can you imagine uh, no no sorry I, geronimo the the worker to whom you know the old politician gave the word say you are the people and he that's very interesting because uh, you have the framing and this politician is going off screen and the only thing that stays there is his hands and then he said you are the people and you see his hands pointing to this Geronimo who is who presents himself as the uh, leader of the syndicate etc but doesn't know what to do and when he uh, has this kind of discourse uh, Paulo comes and and put his hands on on, on his mouth and and say this was he's a kind of very strong provocation you see, this is the people, the, the politicized, uh, uh, what else he says, um, um, a kind of in, um, stupid, etc. And then the other guy comes to correct the sense of the people, said, no, he's not the people, I am the people. And the only thing he says when he says, I am the people, is the description of his uh, poverty. And then he's killed as a dissident and extremist, etc. In that scene, uh, we have this guy uh, killed in a kind of Buñuelan way. It's a kind of very exaggerated and, and uh, everything is done in this guy and he, he, he dies with uh, the gun in his mouth, etc. The same actor, who plays this uh, poor guy that uh, corrects the, what in Brazil we call Pelego. Pelego in, in Brazil is this kind of uh, worker's leader uh, who plays a double game. He's in fact, he's more related to the, uh, his boss than to uh, the workers and he in a way obeys a kind of political force that is not really interested in, in the, the workers struggle he's a what we call pelego and the other one is not so tries to correct the same guy is there killing Diaz when Paulo has that kind of delirium and when Diaz is killed we see Paulo grabbing the crown so when he says on the soundtrack, the triumph of, bath, of beauty and justice, we see him grabbing the crown. So what we see in the image is his uh, search for power. That's the last statement about Paulo. 
that the film presents to us, you know, is the essence, let's say, what is, what means his death is that he had this search for power and he was defeated. So the image and the sound, his words, uh, are in contradiction. And this is something that I said, you know, he is the narrator, you know, he is the source of the flashback, but a lot of scenes and a lot of images are not the expression of his point of view, but uh, the expression of his unconscious mind and of his, you know, deeper drives, deeper desires. And that is a major scene, I think, of this contradiction between what he says and what the image shows to us. And he grabs the power, he, he wants the crown. Um, and in this sense, I think uh, uh, all his kind of very, um, I can say, uh, what, how can I say in English, this kind of behavior um, is kind of contradictory, is unpredictable sometimes. We don't see coherence in his action. We don't see coherence between his action and his poetry. We don't see coherence in any sense in Paulo. He's always passionate, he's always impulsive, and uh, he has this kind of desire that is always hidden. And at the end, there is a statement not coming from him, but coming from another uh, narrative instance in the film, uh, bringing this kind of... Uh, shot in which he is expressing his deep desire as power. Um, so, with all his uh, incoherence and, uh, and contradiction, one thing at the end is clear. That is, the, the main question for him is power. And that's one thing that we could uh, give as an answer of uh, the way Paolo behaves. And the fact that there is no, not a single positive political figure in the film. Left or right, in between, populist or not, there is not a single, let's say, embodiment of what could be seen as uh, a positive character. There is no, not. Sara herself could be seen the but at the same time, she, she is involved in this populist strategy and she has no critical view of it. Yeah. And at the same time, uh, I said she is the voice of reason, but it, uh, and also she is the only person who quotes uh, uh, a line uh, written by Bethel Brecht when mm -hmm. she said, she doesn't say the same thing that Brett said, that, uh, but said, we don't need heroes. Mm. And, you know, Brett said, you know, um, in Portuguese, I could say, but in, I don't know the original in German, but uh, he says that um, um, poor, a poor, uh, let's say, it's not a, um, uh, a country that needs heroes. Uh, I don't know say how say we say um, when you say that you were in a kind of lamenting sentence uh, towards someone. You say "pobre dele" that he needs. Uh, uh, it's a pity that he needs. I would say like in English, it's a pity that he needs uh, someone. And so and and there is a, I don't know the original, but the, uh, Brett has a sentence about a country that needs heroes. Uh, so uh, um, we should uh, pity a country that needs heroes. It's a problem to need heroes. And she says that when he is in the suicidal action. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, she, sometimes she's absolutely so maternal towards him. Mm. It's amazing how she acts sometimes as a mother. And again, her behavior is not all the time uh, the figure of the light, the figure of 
person who is um, seeing what the others don't see. Sometimes it is, but sometimes not. So there is no really positive figure that could represent any hope. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry think, to um, interrupt. We could continue yeah, talking yeah. about the film. And uh, thank you very much, Ismail and Vincent, for this great talk. And thank you, everybody who stayed until the end. I'm um, very glad. And thank you very much for your patience in some way. I mean, what we really should do now is, you know, take our seats again. Watch the film one more time. Yes. <laughs> and then continue the discussion. But I'm afraid Laura is not going to let us. Uh, uh, well, we could, but I think that we unfortunately have to yeah. close down and yeah. our colleagues want to go home as well. Yeah. But I would like to invite you all to come on the 25th of January. We'll be here again with uh, Fernão Ramos, also a professor coming from Brazil. And he will be talking about the film Sem Essa Aranha um, from Rogério Desganzela. And uh, it's going to be great. So it would be awesome if you could uh, be there as well. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you. And yeah, Thank see you, you next coming. time. <laughs>